The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode four of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factory Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Thank you all for listening for, to the first three episodes. I really appreciate all the feedback. I've gotten some nice suggestions for future episodes, so please, if you have any ideas, shoot them over at to mike at drumfactordirect.com. Um, season one is just about in a can, so I need to start getting ideas going for season two, so just please shoot them over. Also, if you have any specific questions you'd like me to answer, I would love to start a listener question segment on this show. So again, you can shoot those over to mike at drumfactordirect.com or you can DM me on Instagram at uh, Mike Dawson Drums or on the Drum Factor Direct Instagram page as well. I monitor that one often. Um, so this week, um, I've got my good friend Mark Juliana on the show. Uh, I've known Mark since the early 2000s when he was just getting going with uh, the great jazz bassist Avishai Cohen's band. So it's been amazing to, to watch how his career went from you know, being at the forefront of, of modern jazz and getting tons of really great sideman work to making a conscious decision to stop doing that, starting his own band, which is more electronic and groove based called Beat Music, and then morphing that into a second band called the Mark Julian Jazz Quartet. Um, and then having that spinning off of different projects and then eventually landing with David Bowie on uh, the album Black Star. David Bowie's final record that is Mark on that that album and then most recently he's been popping up on TV appearances with St. Vincent so he's one of my favorite drummers my favorite people very insightful very creative um, I don't get to talk gear with him much so this is a this is a unique time to uh, just pick his brain about gear and specifically snare drums and also just a little bit more about his his approach to creative practice and all of that so super excited to talk to Mark um, so let's just get to it. Here we go. Me and Mark Giuliano. Enjoy the show. Mark Giuliano, welcome into the show. How you doing, man? I'm good. Thanks for having me. How are you? I'm doing okay. Not too bad. So I learned that Pittsburgh, I mean, I'm new to Pittsburgh, moved here a few months ago. Same climate as London. Okay. Dark, rainy, cloudy. Like when the sun comes out, the news is like announcing the sun is out today. Mm-hmm. But how Quite. how does the food compare to London? <laughs> well, I haven't found any good curry, that's for sure. Okay. All well, right. That's a problem. But lots of good food so far. Found some good seafood, surprisingly. Oh, wow. It's safe to eat oysters in Pittsburgh. I've had them twice, and they were okay. Okay. So far, so good. <laughs> <laughs> nice. But not... So are you fully California man now? So anyone listening, Mark grew up in New Jersey... Mm -hmm. Did you ever live in New York City or were you always in Jersey? Yes, from usually, you know, uh, usually on the Jersey side of the Hudson, mostly Hoboken or Jersey City. But yeah, there were definitely a few stints in the city. So how is the opposite coast feeling to you? It's great. It's great. I mean, it's certainly, it's a pleasant place to be in, during a lockdown, that's for sure. Right. Um, made the winter a lot easier than I I was hearing from my New York friends how isolation yeah. plus winter was not too fun um, and I would be shooting hoops outside while I'm talking to them you know and kind of rubbing <laughs> it in but uh, <clears throat> no it's been it's been good and um, just pleasant and we're we're just north of downtown, so lots of friends around. It's pretty, uh, it, I haven't really, knock on wood, I haven't um, had to confront too many of the L.A. stereotypes of horrific mm. traffic and and things like that because we're in a, a good spot where we could get around pretty easily. So, yeah, so far so good. So I think we last touched base in March of last year, I think, or maybe it was May. It was almost a year ago. Yeah, wow. And I think you were just kicking off your Patreon page at the time. I don't mm -hmm. even think you had launched it when the last time we talked. So Correct. You know, what have you been doing to keep yourself creative and occupied and productive this past year? Yeah, isn't that the 
the question. Jeez. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Patreon model helped me kind of create some deadlines for myself and mm -hmm. kind of paint myself into some corners that I then had to creatively f get myself out of. You know, I realized mm -hmm. that pre-lockdown... I was always, so I was so lucky to be in a lot of creative situations, always surrounded by creative people. And I, I didn't realize until that went away that I was so reliant on collaboration and all of that energy, in, interpersonal energy to stay creative and stay hungry, you know. So I kind of had to find ways to try to generate that on my own. And, and again, on Patreon, I was making videos a couple times a month. I was doing Q and A's with guys. Still am. I've transitioned mm. the videos into live streams, which has been a really nice challenge to try to improvise for an hour with some drums, maybe a little like a little electronics. Why'd you do this and, shift? Um, I found is, that when I was making the videos, or more? yeah, when I was when I was making the videos, I was spending way more time editing video than I was making music. You know, and and the videos mm -hmm. would be four minutes long, and I'm spending two days trying to make it look cool. And I was like, mm -hmm. I'd rather play and create for sixty minutes and just let it go out live and see what happens. Um, try to redirect the creativity into the world that feels a little more appropriate. You know, and then yeah, I've been teaching mm -hmm. through there. Got, had a bunch of guys. And that's been nice to virtually have a connection that way. And slowly but surely, mm -hmm. some things have been starting to happen in the real world. So it's, um, you know, still a little strange. Um, and I'm in no yeah. rush for the world to just snap back to normalcy. But it is nice to see a little, a little light coming in, for sure. So before we get into that, um, with the live stream stuff, what is your... How do you approach that? It seems like such a, you know, option overload. <laughs> what do you, how do you get started? Yeah, so it's, it's all about limitations, I guess, in, in some ways mm. and, and restrictions. I'm restricted by, phys my physical restrictions are actually quite helpful. I have this little whisper room in my studio, mm. seven by seven, so I can only hit the things that fit in there, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is quite simple, but a, a, a welcomed restriction. And I have a little, some pedals set up and a couple synths and different stuff to just, you know, to have different layers. And then, yeah, I just, um, I mean, my first intentions were like, let me see if I could go for 20 minutes, you know, see if I could try to create something that someone might want to hear or might sustain interest for 20 minutes. And then they started to, you know, get closer to an hour. And not that someone wants to hear all of it, but, you know, there would be moments that I'd land in a place where like, oh, this is kind of cool. So um, it's been really fun also just for my focus. I haven't mm. needed to like, um, you know, be in that headspace for that amount of time this this whole lockdown because even if i was doing recordings at home you know you do a take and then you tweak some stuff or do another take it's five six seven minutes at a time that you're kind of trying to have mm -hmm. access to that space and now to try to stretch that over an hour it's it it's not quite as satisfying or as um you know committed as a live performance in front of people with other musicians, you know, that's, that's that headspace that I've been desperately missing, you know, mm -hmm. and it's so difficult to fabricate it without those environmental elements. But the live stream has been the thing that's gotten the closest to that kind of energy. So it's been really a, a great challenge, but super fun. So has there ever been any of these where you get started on an idea and you're like, oh, I don't like this, and you just abandon ship? How does it progress? How does an hour of improv progress? Yeah, uh, good question. I, I think the thing that I find usually when I listen back is that 
I usually abandon ship too early on certain mm. ideas. So sometimes the battle is, you know, so oftentimes that voice is right. Like, hey, this sucks. You should bail. You know, <laughs> that voice is definitely accurate from time to time, but not always. Yeah. And I find that um, if I can kind of push that voice away just a little bit, quiet it down and stay put in this idea, something is bound to happen, you know? Mm. So uh, really a lot of it is trying to resist that temptation to cons constantly be moving on or m looking for a new thing and to just try to stay home in whatever that idea is and trust that even if it doesn't feel great in that moment, hopefully something will start to appear that um, will be a bit of a payoff, you know? So I use um, improvisation for me to find holes in my playing, like technical mm. or vocabulary. Inevitably, I try to go for something, and I'm like, I have no idea what I was just trying to do. And for that sure. just derails the whole thing. But has that been kind of a strategy? For, like, how does this then turn into your daily practice when you're not streaming? You know, like, how do you maintain your skill when you have no expectations? <laughs> you mm. know? Um. Yeah, geez, that's that's interesting. I think for me, playing and practicing are two wildly different things. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was younger, they used to be much more similar. But I found that when they were closer together and more related, there was uh, it w there was a much greater chance that things that I was practicing would just appear in the playing without me necessarily meaning them to appear. Mm -hmm. um, so nowadays, if I am practicing, it's um, really, I try to put as much space between that stuff and the playing as possible. So it might just be super rudimental or foundational things on the pad. Mm -hmm. Just strictly, it's almost more for maintenance rather than, uh, you know, I guess by definition, progress. Mm -hmm. It's... Um, it's like, I, th I feel like the growth, you know, oh, say maybe in my 20s, I haven't really quantified this, so I'm just kind of riffing here, but say in my 20s, it was more about tangible progress within my practicing on a technical level, ideas, flow, mm -hmm. things like that. But since then, it's been more so, the growth has been more conceptual and the technical stuff, I just, it's more of a maintenance um, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, so <clears throat> usually I can get away with just playing a bunch of gigs or a bunch of rehearsals and that is the maintenance. Mm -hmm. But in this last year, I've had to be a little more proactive about the maintenance, but it really usually ends up uh, really simplistic stuff that, of course, I can still find ways to improve, you know? Yeah. What is your routine? Do you have a routine or does it change up? Uh, totally changes up. I think, um, I mean, to be honest, when if I had time, tr truly empty time where I was like, okay, I want to, quote, practice, I usually end up at the piano, you know, mm. and it's more compositional because... I'm tr always trying to feed, whether it's beat music or jazz quartet or whatever kind of projects, I'm always trying to feed that repertoire with new stuff. Even though we don't have gigs, it's still, I want to, once once those gigs do reappear, I want to make sure there's a bunch of new music we can play and really get our hands dirty that way. So I usually end up at the piano, but drum-wise, um, yeah, there's no routine. I, I do like to include improvisation in the process, just for mm -hmm. to, it keeps my mind a little more engaged. But it's just your usual combinations of singles and doubles and flams and moving between rates and, yeah, maybe have the Dodger game on in the background, you know, the usual. <laughs> <laughs> How are they doing? I haven't been following them at all. I mean, they came out of the great... They came out of the gate super strong, but they're in a bit of a slump now. So I'm going to the game on Saturday. I'm actually going to Anaheim because they're they're playing at the Angels. So okay, um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see if I bring them some luck. 
<laughs> so let's let's talk about snare drums. So this whole first season is about snare drums, and I'm going to be rebuilding this this steel drum. Uh, we'll talk more about that. But what was your first snare drum? So I was gifted um, some drums from a cousin of mine, and it was like an old Slingerland beater kit, and it was like a bass drum and a rack tom and a snare drum. So it was like the metal snare drum that came with that kit. I know nothing about it. I only had it for a few months. Mm. Um, and it was just something to hit, really. You know, mm -hmm. I had, I cut out, I didn't have any symbols, so I cut out like um, circles from cardboard boxes and I would hit those, you know. It was, <laughs> it was definitely pretty... Um, you know, just playing, like, playing along to Green Day albums and stuff. But I, the first kit that, like, I asked for and my parents bought me was a Pearl Export kit. Mm. So that drum, also a steel drum that came with that. So this is maybe 1996 or something. So, wine red. Oh, five, you got 12, wine red. Yeah, yes. tw 22, <laughs> 12, 13, 16. From Power Richie's, Toms. from yeah, Richie's music in um, I want to say Denville, New Jersey, maybe Rockaway, somewhere yeah. out there. Um, and uh, yeah, so the snare drum that that came with that kit. I always mm -hmm. forget about that drum. So my export came with the same snare, but it had a um, like a like a straight steel shell. But most of them I saw had like little ribs in it. Do you remember which one? If you had straight, the straight shell? mine was straight. Oh yeah, we always had the same, same yeah. era then. That drum was great. I never should have sold it. I, yeah, I never uh, should have sold it. I have no recollection of selling it, but I guess I did. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where it is. <laughs> but that kit did me well. I mean, um, it was fun. It was in that time where, like, each birthday or each Christmas, it was an opportunity to get one new thing. Yeah. Right. So it was like, oh, the next birthday you get the ten inch tom. Or yes. The, <laughs> and then, and then you get the, the boom arm with a splash, and you you know so slowly it got it got bigger and bigger. So what did you do with the thirteen inch tom? Did you put it in a floor tom position, or did you go no. three up? Three up, yeah. It's nice. first two up, yeah. Now I could never do that. I'm I the, my drums are so much lower than they were then, or they <laughs> you had to angle them kind of pointing at you, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean the the. Those drums were the first drums that really got me hooked. They helped get me hooked. So it was it was great. I mean, and just throw a coated ambassador on there and and you're done. Mm -hmm. You know, which is which is still for the record, you know, since we're recording, <laughs> I will share my very secret snare drum tuning philosophy. Okay. Okay. Throw a code and ambassador on and you're done. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's still my approach. So what was the first snare drum that you like bought? Like this is a snare drum I'm buying. Yeah, so it's funny. I've I've so rarely ever bought isolated mm. snare drums. They were part of a kit. So the next like kit I got was from a guy older than me in high school and it was a Star Classic kit really nice so nice maple kit and uh, it was the matching snare for that and so that okay. kind of got me into college and then someone actually stole that i think i you know how you used to have like the lockers where you lock your stuff up yep. in school yeah must have left it unlocked or it was out and somebody grabbed it um and then i started borrowing drums and then i bought um a and and the only reason I thought to buy it was to replace oh no I'm sorry I'm sorry let me back up a little I did buy cuz those that star classic kit was bigger sizes I bought bebop sizes of a Yamaha Maple Custom Absolute mm. and that snare drum was like my go to for a long time that that stayed kind of the main drum for a while and then I did buy from a friend a Ludwig um like the student model Acrolyte, mm -hmm. which I still have, and it, I love it. I actually used it a little bit on 
Black Star, like some of the more cr- the tunes that needed like a cranked snare. Really, I, I had that with me. Yeah, it's. I Is that the, probably yeah, bu- the black one, right? The black galaxy one. Yes, it has some like sparkles in there. Yeah, yeah. It's great. It's a total. Um, I mean, again, I bought it from a friend, maybe for a hundred bucks in college, mm-hmm. you know, and it's a great option. So is that the only drum from your early days that's stuck with you? Earlier days? Yes. Yes, that's the only, that's probably the oldest. Yeah, probably the oldest drum I own or the, yeah, that of, of mine. So yeah. what made the trip from Jersey with you? So your right wives. now I have <laughs> not your family. Mo- yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I have um mostly Gretsch drums and they're all new or meaning f- uh, cuz my formal relationship with them started maybe 2007 or 8 mm-hmm. somewhere in there. So um no drums are older than that, you know, mm-hmm. but but they're um I, I for me the even the new Gretsch drums still have kind of a, a an old soul, you know. So I, I you know, I every now and then I'm peeking around online to try to track down a proper vintage kit, but I feel like I I can get access to those sounds or get close as as close as I need for now mm-hmm. without actually having to go proper vintage. So a bunch of different kind of from the the three different USA lines, the USA, Brooklyn, and Broadcaster. Mm-hmm. I have a couple from each of those, slightly different depths and, and you know, a wrap or chrome or, you know, chrome over brass, stuff like that. So, um, but yeah, with the exception of that Ludwig, um, don't have too much variety otherwise. Now, do you have like, you're coming from a, such a different different world than like the traditional studio drummer mindset of that drum does that thing, so I got to get that drum for that thing. Like, what would you just grab if if you had to go play a gig right now with your band with beat music? What would be the snare that you would just grab? Yeah, so at the moment, I have like a Brooklyn, the the snare drum that came with the first Brooklyn I got from Gretsch. That one's kind of in a beat music place a little bit cranked and just ever slow slightly dampened mm-hmm. um and i also have a usa custom that kind of lives in that place too i've been coming around i always thought like why do you need all these snare drums just tune it differently you know and then mm-hmm. I've, I've come around and understand the value not just for convenience but also for the drum itself to let it live in one place Mm-hmm. And let it kind of settle. And if you get it right, just don't touch it. You know, excuse me. So what would be the jazz quartet drum? Yeah, at the moment I have kind of a, a broadcaster in bebop sizes that stays pretty cranked. Because mm-hmm. I found specifically, specifically drums that are cranked uh, do much better living there. You know, mm-hmm. if... if Maybe it's just some of the science of the head after it gets stretched out. It it has a harder time coming down. It's not that it can happen, but I've just found that um, once it gets up to a certain place, I try to leave it. Um, so, and Tom's included because right now that kit it's pretty pretty high tuning. So, and to be honest, still just the factory heads, which I'm pretty sure are just coated ambassadors, just with mm-hmm. the Gretsch logo. So. I haven't touched those for three. Maybe I got that kit three years ago. Mm-hmm. You know, set it and forget it. So when you show up to a backline kit, what is the first thing you do to the snare to kind of get it where it needs to be for you? Um. So it depends on the. Let's say in the beat music world, I'm, I just need like a a little bit of a crack, but also some depth. You know, so I can't crank it too much to where the rim shot, like the rim shot will be cool, but then maybe it's, I'm missing all that low end. So I try Mm -hmm. to find that sweet spot where it's not low, 
because you know there's kind of that line if you go below a certain line of tight to loose you know it's it's almost like the rim shot starts to choke the drum or it mm. choke the sound you know there are certain certain tunings where you kind of can't play a rim shot you know so mm-hmm. i want to be above that so i can still play a rim shot but not go as high as i would with the jazz quartet Mm-hmm. You know, so it's much more of a, a the rim shot is the, um, you know, uh, what would you call it? The guide mm-hmm. as to where I should stop. Whereas with the jazz quartet, it's just about the pitch with snares off and its relationship to the toms. Um, okay. So I'm not, um, it's, it's not a specific pitch that I'm going for, but it's just like an intuitive relationship um with the toms and you know i i'm not sure if this is controversial or not i'd like to hear your opinion <laughs> but i really think tuning is 100 percent a, a two-way street a two-way relationship it's not just i have a sound in my head and i'm gonna get this from whatever drum you hand me it's no hello drum how are you mm. where would you like to be you know i I, I want to include, try do my best to use my intuition to try to see where this drum wants to be because who knows, the night before, maybe it was backlined at some wildly different musical environment, but that head settled in a particular way or a lot of times often in a jazz backline, the drums might show up even higher than I might want them. Mm but they're mm-hmm. just sitting in such a place that feels so natural for that shell or for in, it's just been living there for a bit so i don't want to touch it so it's yeah. it's it's def i'm i'm always approaching new drums open to uh you know i don't want to be set in stone as to where i'm going to get them i want to mm. talk to them and see where they want to be too and then we we kind of meet we compromise you know, because I, I do process? think is that like sound check or loading. Yeah, just I mean, I mean, it can happen within. You're like, bop, boom, boom. Oh, these are cool. Okay, you know, mm-hmm. and and I'm already at peace with. That's eh, a little tighter than I want, but you know what? That's gonna inspire some different ideas. It's gonna, you know, if you if you embrace it, it'll definitely help the expression. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, that's also speaking, kind of getting back to what we were saying about, particularly if the drums are cranked, I have a hard time trusting, you know, kind of semi-used heads coming down from that place yeah, right. and and holding their own. So I'd rather just leave them up in that place where they're already singing, you know? Yeah. So it sounds like for you, maybe beat music is a little bit more defined that you have to be more, more cognizant of. Whereas a yeah, jazz and quartet, then, it's like get the instrument that sounds good and, and roll with it. Exactly, exactly. And um, yeah, so with beat music, it's maybe a drum needs a little more dampening than another, uh, mm-hmm. things like that. But it all ends up, it definitely ends up in a quite, I think the range is pretty small for beat music where it ends up. Like they get, they all get pretty close without any hyper intentional like um um what do you call it like a a tuning what do you call that thing that helps you tune you put it on the like a gauge oh the drum dial yeah the drum dial or very particular muting techniques like void Mm. of those things you know you use your ear and you still end up pretty close so so if i said Give me one example of the perfect snare drum sound. What would you pick? Hmm. Like a recorded version? Yeah. Yeah. You know, more and more, I've been... Fa- you know, like, you're, let's see. I, I, my default mode is in live performance and open sounds and... All mm-hmm. those things. So, you know, for a long time, it's been reflective of that. And, the, you know, the, the the kind of desert island heroes of Elvin and Tony and Roy mm-hmm. and Art Blakey. It's just like, here's the drum. 
you know, this is how it sounds in whatever room they're in, you know. <laughs> yeah. But over time, I really have been enjoying getting into the details and trying to cra- craft very particular sounds. And for me, a, a modern, like a big modern uh, hero of that world is Joey Warrenker. And mm-hmm. and without isolating one track, I mean, just the other day I was spending, I hadn't listened to Beck's Sea Change from, from top to bottom in a while. Mm-hmm. And that's also James Gadsden, of course. But um, I've been really enjoying that sound lately and trying to get access to that sound we're playing super light in the center of the drum you know no that's a good example of no rim shots um and then to like really play in a way where you can because you know joey is thinking more about the way the sound is gonna come through the microphones and through the speakers rather than He's valuing. He's putting much more value in that than even the sound in the room to his yeah. ear. You know, yeah. so that's pretty counterintuitive to to the just set up and go live performance mode. But mm-hmm. I've been really having fun, um, just peeking more into that world. And again, this last year has been a great opportunity to learn more about recording and trying to figure out how to actually get those sounds. Right. So you kind of surprised everyone a bit showing up with St. Vincent on Saturday Night Live, um, I guess it was a month ago at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, awesome. I mean, it was, it was an amazing performance. Very cool. She's Thank She's you. evolved, constantly evolved, and you sounded great. In particular, that snare drum sounded fan-freaking-tastic. Mm. I mean, it was like perfect. Did you have anything to do with that, or did you just show up and hit the drum? <laughs> well, that was I mean, my yeah, drum. It's in your hands, obviously. No, no, but, but it, it was um, it those were my drums, which oh, okay, which was really cool. I mean, we rehearsed in Los Angeles, and um, you know, I I did spend a lot of time trying to get those sounds close to the record, you mm-hmm. know, and um, it's kind of a tight, dry sound. Yeah, and those were. But I had two different snare drums for those two songs, um, and I yeah, I really tried to get them. I was just trying to get as close as I could to the record. And during the rehearsals, we were rehearsing in a studio, uh, so everything was being recorded as we were rehearsing. So it was really mm. nice to be able to hear them through the mics. And then the engineer who was with us in the rehearsal was there for SNL. So it was really, um, the sound was really hooked up. And, um, but yeah, it was, it was so spoiling to be, they were like, Hey, these drums sound good. We'll just send them to New York. I was like, really? (laughs) Cool. So that was, um, uh, incredibly comforting. You show up, you know, on the Thursday of that week when the band rehearses, like, Oh, there are my drums. Cool. Yeah. Um but yeah, that was um actually yeah, it's a snare drum episode. So the two snare drums, <laughs> the snare drum on the first song um was a USA custom, a part of a a matching kit that I have and um oh, so bad with specifics, but you can help me. I bought one of those snare mutes that you clip on the rim and they're kind of leather snare Yes. Snare weight. And that thing is magic. Really, mm. re- super musical, you know? And then what I did is I had a big fat snare drum. Um, I have a, a those guys, I got like a care package from those guys, and I'm super grateful because I'm using this stuff all the time. But I mangled one of the pieces. I hope they don't mind me saying. It was one that had jingles on it, and it was a hard plastic um, so I cut like um, cut maybe a quarter of it off and just taped that onto the head without the jingles, um, kind of opposite the the snare weight. Um, so that was uh, the first song, and then the second song was a Brooklyn drum, and I used the more traditional big fat snare drum with the center cut out, and that just helped get and not you know not too far off from the joey warnker world or at least you know um 
my humble attempt and really cranked the snares actually to help mm. get that kind of choked thing, which I normally never do, especially in the more open tunings. I really want those snares to be ringing, you know, so, um, but yeah, it was, it was, uh, I mean, first of all, just an incredible musical opportunity, very humbling to be a part of that, and a pretty wild first gig after quarantine, <laughs> you know? True. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after a year plus of no gigs, that was a pretty crazy first gig. But yeah, I, to be honest, I, I, if I may say so, I agree that the sound was pretty stunning i mean yeah that that room is not built for live music you know not that it's bad but it's not that it's you know exceptionally good either so i thought they they really got it so dialed i was when i when i watched it back it was pretty cool yeah if anyone listening missed it check it out it was it knocked me out I was like dang that I mean, of course, Mark sounds great, but that drum in particular, I'm like, dang, dude, that is a like snare drum sound. Cool. Yeah, so and that, again, again, no no rim shots. You know, it was in that spot, that kind of lower spot where a rim mm-hmm. shot would, would kind of choke the sound. So, again, usually my default is to play rim shots. So that was kind of another little learning curve to just try to get the same intensity and the same impact just from the center of the drum. I don't think I've ever seen you play songs before. I know how yeah. <laughs> ridiculous that might sound, but I don't think I've ever seen you play songs before. That's funny. That's funny. Yeah, I mean, it's... it's. Um, I love it. I love playing songs when they're good, you know? Yeah. Um, and I'm more than happy to... Again, my my singular goal was to emulate the record, do, do, do my best to play what I was hearing on the record. Um... And, you know, um, as you said, Annie, um, it it was definitely kind of a bit of a 180 for for her. You know, her previous records were pretty electronic. And Mm -hmm. um, I know the live show included a bunch of tracks just because that's the only way to pull that stuff off. And, of course, Matt Johnson playing drums, who's Mm -hmm. a dear friend and uh, one of my favorite drummers. But I, with this kind of 180, I knew there wasn't going to be tracks, but I actually assumed there would be a click just because it seems as though everything in that world is to a click, but um, no click. So that was that was wow. also just, it was like, wait, so we're allowed to just listen to each other and play and... If it moves a click or two, that's okay. You know, it was it was really <laughs> liberating and really exciting to um, remember that music can be made that way. You know. So what what is on the horizon once we get back to I don't know fifty percent normalcy? Like, are you mm. are you hesitant to travel now? Is it gonna? I mean, is it gonna change your outlook on your career at this point? It's a good question. It's really hard to say. I mean, last weekend, beat music had a gig in Miami. There was a there was mm. a jazz festival, the the first edition of a jazz festival, the Bayfront Jazz Festival, and they invited us and and we played and it was cool. I mean, it was a little strange just because it was kind of the first gig back for beat music, and you know, you're on planes and you're hanging out, you're around people and. I mean, I'm fully vaccinated and I had a mask on. So, I, you know, the science says that under those conditions, you're cool, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's still psychologically, I think it's going to take a minute for it to really feel not weird. Um, Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's hard to say career-wise if there will be any major, major changes. but, um, yeah, I'm not in any particular rush to get back to exactly the way it used to be. Mm-hmm. Because, um, I mean, I was, you know, I I was traveling a lot and potentially too much. You know, I hit, I have a million miles with United Airlines, which is 
more so <laughs> embarrassing than not. Like I have some friends when I when that happened, they're like, dude, that's amazing, million miles. I'm like, actually it's it just tells me that I'm on too many damn airplanes. You know, <laughs> that's like true. that's not you shouldn't yeah, be in the air that much. Not gonna help you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So um <laughs> you know, so I think in general, maybe maybe it's just a a natural career arc to at some point be a little more selective about when you're leaving the house. So maybe maybe in some ways COVID has accelerated that, but um can't say anything too concrete yet until we see what it looks yeah. and feels like, you know? Yep. All right, we're going to close it out. I'm asking everyone this. I've got this junky drum. Mm -hmm. If I handed you this drum, it's a steel shell, 5x14, welded, just a rusty triple flange hoops, original crappy throw off, some whatever wires I found when I got the shell. This is like a $30 drum. What would you do first with this drum to upgrade it or to make it better? Yeah, so I would, well, I guess um, it would be helpful to know the context that you wanted to use it in. Hmm, okay. Uh, let's go with beat music, because I would think a jazz quartet, you just crank it up and let it be as weird as it needs to be. Exactly. Yeah, for yeah. beat music, I would, yeah, I'd throw, well, for definitely throw, I can't see what head it is, but throw that coded ambassador on and you're halfway yep. there. Um, <laughs> and then, yeah, again, again, it's like trying to find, I feel like a, I keep repeating myself, but just looking for that sweet spot for a rim shot. Yeah. Um, but still getting some bottom. So I'm not sure how much bottom that drum will give you, but try to maybe a, just a little bit of dampening um you know whether it's kind of a moon gel type thing or a wallet or big fast snare drum any of the different ways could do but trying to get it find that line cuz it's different in every drum where this where it'll be too low for the rim shot get it yeah. just above that um and make sure the rim shot is satisfying but you're you're maximizing whatever kind of low end or depth you can get from it mm -hmm. um and yeah i'm all about 30 dollar drums to be honest i i i have played in my life i've i could definitely say i've played more drums that i don't own than than i do own you know the as yeah. you very well know the new york drummer reality of playing different <laughs> drums every night and um, I've always embraced that and get it, gotten a lot of joy from that little challenge of, all right, you have 40 minutes to make, to sound like yourself, you know? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so I actually love um, trying to, how, how quickly can you develop a relationship with a new instrument? I think that's just like, that maybe that could be season two of your, of your show but uh <laughs> um i've i've kind of had to figure out some ways of how to get from a to b as quickly as possible you know within the, a quick little sound check so it's i i definitely don't have any um really set in stone tuning um techniques mm -hmm. or things like that it's just like whatever it takes to get it there um i'm all for it well, that's the easiest upgrade. I'm going to put a coated ambassador on it and see what it does. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. I appreciate taking the time, Mark. Is there anything um, everyone should go check out Mark's Patreon page? Is it just patreon.com slash Mark Juliana? I believe so. Yes. You can find him in the search window there. Lots of really creative content, cool stuff. Um, what else? Anything else we should let everyone know about? New record? Oh, a little EP came out recently called Ancient Practice. I got invited by, there's this guy, Ian Urbina. He's a, an author, or like a journalist for the New York Times. And he wrote this book called The Outlaw Ocean. And it like documents all of this like wild stuff happening in international waters that goes mm. ungoverned. And he, uh, he started this music 
project to to couple with it and he's been inviting lots of artists from around the world to just essentially almost like create a soundtrack to the journalism so i made a little ep uh and that was a fun project that was um you know just made at home um and yeah that came out and just chipping away i guess um you know to be continued just trying to stay creative and and happy you know yeah dig it. well you look good you look healthy thank you so, sir california i like your shirt well. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rocking marley's custom there you go shirt very cool protest sign <laughs> yep <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Uh, we will. So, yeah, you'll probably be the first. So what I'm doing with everyone is I'm doing their suggested upgrades and I'm going to document it. So cool. yours is going to have to be the easiest because I'm just going to put a new head on it and see what it does. Great. <laughs> Great. Great. Let All me right, know thanks, how it Mark. goes. All right. It's time to work on this gig steel snare drum a little bit more. So this week, my objective was to fix the internal muffler that I botched last week. Um, to fix a couple lugs that had broken hex nut swivel screws, interior screw, uh, swivel screws that I need to replace, or maybe replace the lugs altogether. I had um, a couple tension rods I wanted to swap out, so I ended up deciding to just swap them all out, all fresh tension rods, and also I put um, nine line washers in addition to the, the metal washer on the tension rod. I think that's a, a great, cheap, easy way to upgrade your snare drum just as far as the tunability. It makes it a lot smoother. Seems to hold the tuning a little bit better. It's a simple upgrade. If you haven't thought about that, just get some nine line washers. We have them in white and black, I believe. It makes a big difference, believe it or not. And then also I wanted to put um, 42 strand snare wires on it. That was Ben Hilziger's suggestion from last week, episode three. Um, so here's where I came into some problems. I was also going to try to replace the throw off. So I took the drum apart for the internal muffler. I ended up having to widen one of the holes in the shell because the holes on the muffler didn't line up with the holes on the shell. That's a theme of this drum, this peculiar gig percussion drum. None of the holes are standard sizes. So when I took apart one of the lugs to fix the swivel nut, I thought, why don't we just see if we can replace all the lugs? Well, these holes are spaced five centimeters apart, whereas most double, you know, two-ended lugs are spaced two inches apart. So it's about an eighth of an inch off. Um, so I couldn't use any of the die-cast lugs that we have at the warehouse here. Um, it was just nothing would fit, and I didn't want to drill the shell. So then we thought, why don't we use the um, little single-point aluminum ball lugs? And then, you know, we'd have one on top and one on the bottom separate. But the holes in the shell are too small for the receivers in the lugs, so I couldn't get the lug to go into the shell. So I had to go back to just trying to fix the, the old beat up box lugs that are on this thing. Ended up just having to replace a couple of the swivel nuts and that was it. Um, they held fine after that. So I guess moral of the story is sometimes just leave it or fix the minimal that you need to. Okay, so that was that got the lugs decent shape. Um, so I put the bottom head back on. Putting the 42 strand snare wires on. Um, first of all, I put them on upside down like a dummy, but after I figured that out and <laughs> put them on the right way, um, I realized this shell doesn't, I don't think this shell has any snare beds. And if you don't have any snare beds and try to put an extra wide snare uh, strainer on here, 42 strand wire set, they don't seat right so you get a just a rattle there's no amount of tension you can put you can pull on these wires to get them to seat really comfortably i was able to kind of finagle it a bit by loose keeping the bat the bottom head pretty loose especially on the left and right side of the wires themselves but um it's still kind of rattled I, I could never get a tight crisp snare sound which maybe that's not what you want with this this 42 strand set anyway but just something to think about if you're considering putting a wider set of wires on your drum make sure it's got nice wide snare beds otherwise it's just not going to work for you i hate for you to just waste your money i think you're better off with a, with a skinnier set on a drum that has you know no snare beds or like barely any snare beds so i sort of made that work um, flipped it back over what was the next issue oh, i was going to replace the throw off well the whole spacing for the throw off on this shell is just so out of whack. It's like they bent 
they bent the, the mounting portion the opposite way it should have been. So I have to deal with what I got until I decide to drill the shell. Now, I'll probably do that eventually, but for now I just put the old one back on and just dealt with it and then tune the drum up. So this week we've got, still had the UV1 coated on top from Carter's suggestions and the 300 series on the bottom. Diecast tubes top and bottom from Mike Johnson's suggestions. We now have the internal muffler, which it works. Um, not my favorite option. I think I would still rather just have some external things, some snare weights or big fast snare drums or moon gels or just a roll of gaffer tape. Cause I'm afraid, you know, a few hundred times of engaging and disengaging this thing, it might, it might strip, I'm not sure. I'm not a huge fan of internal mufflers. It's a cool idea. I think we just need a more modern uh, design for that. So who knows, maybe something will be coming down the pike. Um, so yeah, so as far as the, um, the demo here, I started again, D over G, my standard starting point, which I would consider medium high, played it wide open, then turned on the internal muffler, played it some more, cranked it to half turn on all the lugs, no muffler with muffler, another half turn, so we're getting super high, no muffler, and then with the muffler. Then I took it all the way down to, you know, barely finger tight, no muffler with the muffler. And then from there, I just left the muffler engaged and then tuned it back up till I got to the point where I felt like I had arrived at a happy spot. And then this week it ended up being exactly where I started. So I went from D up to probably F sharp, all the way down to whatever the lowest note is. And then just by feel and sound, I landed right back where I started, which was D, you know, tension rod note of a D on the top and a G on the bottom. No, it wasn't a G on the bottom because I had to detune it. I don't know what the bottom was. <laughs> I have no idea because I had to detune the bottom to accommodate the squirrely wires that weren't quite seating properly. Um, so that's a little trick. If your wires are rattling too much, detune the, the tension rods to the left, right of the, the wires pretty much all the way. That definitely helps. Uh, you can hear it in the demo. This drum is, is pretty wet sounding. There's a lot of sizzle. Yeah, so let's um, let's check it out. Here's the demo.
Well, that's it for episode four. Thank you all for listening. Please, if you enjoy the show and you don't mind dropping a review over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast, it will certainly help get the show in front of more people. And if you want to share the link to the shows to some of your fellow drum nerd friends, I'd much appreciate it. I uh, hope you have a great week, and I will see you next week. We have Antonio Sanchez. See you then. <laughs>